Hello and thank you for watching this presentation by the American Iron Society. Please support the organization by becoming a member. Go to irises.org and click on join. Thank you. So tonight we're talking about the basics of beardless. Um, and what do we mean by beardless? When most people think iris, they think the tall, bearded, ruffly, fluffly, um, dry rhizome iris. Uh, and so we have this little picture of the bearded and we, here we have a beard. This is a really nice looking beard. And a beardless does not have that fuzzy thing. Instead, it has a signal of some sort to guide the bees in there. The other major difference on these uh, is that the beardless bloom at us in most places at a different time than the than the bearded's uh, and their rhizome is significantly different and we'll get into that but so what we're talking about today is a, a huge huge group of uh, of uh, of irises that do not have this beard and are grown differently from the bearded iris and tonight, I'm just going to focus on three commonly grown groups that are fairly easy for uh, the average gardener to grow. And let me see this. And so one of the reasons why we grow beardless iris is they will extend your bloom season. I have, uh, it, normally the tall bearded bloom season here is the last two weeks of May. But because I grow a lot of different beardless, I have them growing and blooming until, you know, 4th of July, uh, different types. Also, we can mulch them, which helps with weed control. I find them much easier to grow than beardeds because I hate weeding. And I live on what used to be old corn land, so everything is resistant to every kind of weed killer you can think of. Also, they play really well with others, and I, I like a mixed uh, garden bed. I don't like industrial rows of irises, so I put other things with them, and the beardless uh, are quite happy uh, growing with other plants, where some of the beardeds are not. Also, they prefer, prefer moisture conditions, and in my area, I have heavy clay soil, and we get a lot of rain, so I don't have to worry uh, about things rotting out. So those are some of the reasons why you might want to. And we'll take a look at, at some. And uh, I think you'll see that there might be worth your while. So the three, uh, the three types we're going to talk about tonight are the Siberian, the Spurias, and the Louisianas. And I think a lot of people know about Siberians, and not as many people know about Spurias and Louisianas. So the characteristics of the beard, whoops, the, the common characteristics to all of them is they grow in ordinary garden conditions. You don't really need to do anything terribly special for these. Um, there are some amendments that will help them and we'll get to that a little later. They t they're planted in the fall when things start to cool down. Uh, you don't wanna plant them in the heat. Um, they are planted one to three inches below the soil and the depth depends upon the type. And you wanna use a balanced fertilizer on these, just as you would for any other iris, uh, a 10-10-10 or a 15 15 15 What you wanna avoid is having this first number larger than the other two numbers. So that's your nitrogen number, and that's just gonna push foliage at the expense of your, um, the rhizome and the bloom, and that's what you don't wanna do. Uh, also, like as I said, they can be mulched and they are not likely to bloom the first year. If they bloom the first year after planting for you, you're very, very lucky and you've done something really, really right. Any questions so far? Good. So let's take a look at Siberians. This is Bob Hollingworth's seedling bed. One section of his seedling bed. And when I was working, I had this blown up and pasted on the wall of my office and said, this is the reason I'm working. <laughs> so someday I can do something like this. Of course, that's way too much work for me because I'm lazy. 
So Siberians aren't all blue. I think the common gardener may know Caesar's brother, and that may be all that's available at your local garden center, but there's lots and lots of different color patterns and forms in Siberians. This is paprikash. It fits in very nicely in any perennial bed. As you can see, it makes a nice little clump. They, they are uh, several heights as well. You can get them fairly tall or you can get them really, really short. Um, it, and a lot of it depends on, uh, some of it depends on culture, but some of it also depends on the um, species that are behind them, that are, they're bred up from. This is Tom Schaefer, which is a beautiful yellow. Yellow is a relatively, I would say relatively recent um, development in Siberians, and now there are a ton of them, and they have really nice form, and there's some really gorgeous yellows. They do well in ordinary garden conditions and they have they form very neat clumps and you can leave them in place for many years. That's the other benefit, to me at least, of these beardless is I don't have to dig them up and separate them every three years. This is Judy, Judy, Judy. And you see that's a nice clump. There's no dead spots in the middle of that. Just a beautiful, beautiful clump. And here's the, here they are playing nicely in the border. You can see that this, this is a tall uh, Siberian. It's got a lot of typhifolia in its background. Be you, you iris nerds, um, you'll know that that's one of the background species. It tends to be very tall. And you can Jody, see- Jody? Yes. Jody, there's a question. Do gophers like these rhizomes? You know, they're small. The rhizomes are, are small. So they, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with gophers because we don't have them here. But I know that the other, other critters don't bother them because they're not worth their time. Does, does, how about anybody else in the, what are you, in Texas area? In gopher country? Do you have trouble with anybody else? This was from Carolyn Ibarra and it doesn't, I don't know where she's from is the question. We have gophers in, oh, she's in California. Yeah, we do have gophers in California. It's so true. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to rely on the Californians to, uh, as we go along, try to come up with an answer for that. Okay. For me in California, the gophers don't mess with irises. They prefer other things, fruit trees, peach trees, avocado trees, but they have not been in my iris gardens. I see. Oh. And then another question is about voles. Do you see voles? Yeah, and they don't, bo they don't bother these rhizomes at all. Um, they did eat all my sweet potatoes this year, but they did not bother the irises. <laughs> oh, no. The only, time, the only time I have seen something eat an iris was I had a new planting of Louisianas, and that has a big, fat rhizome. And the deer came along and scooped one out like a baked potato. I couldn't believe that they ate it, but they did. That's the only time I've ever seen anything eat an iris. All right, okay. thank you. And here they are, and in, in my area, they bloom when the peonies bloom. And we have a little, uh, I guess that's a little Monarda up there blooming, but the peonies and the, and the Siberians bloom at the same time for me. And somebody asked about chip, what about chipmunks and squirrels in the Northeast? And I don't have, I don't have any trouble with critters bothering these at all. Uh, uh, like all irises, they, they, they don't, they don't taste good. Um, they're, the foliage on beardless is tougher than the foliage on beardeds. And we'll get to, when we, we will go through these and then we will talk about, um, planting and care in the first season and also pests and diseases. But they're relatively pest free because they, their foliage is so much tougher. So 
uh, you can see down here and and you know i'm not i'm not the world's best photographer but they provide a really nice uh grass-like element in the garden after they bloom too their foliage can be up to 30 inches tall depending on um, the variety you're growing and it can either be straight or it could be fountain like depending on the variety and the blooms tend to float above well above the foliage And if you like variety, you can get multi-petals. This is, let's see, ha uh, having fun is this one, and this is Kaboom, and these are both from Ensada Gardens. They do a lot of the multi-petal stuff. Um, that last one was Head Start, which is the very first one, the yellow one was the first one to bloom. So you can get some variety in your, you know, in your blooms. They don't all have to look like the early ones. And if you like novelties, we also have flatties in Siberians. This is helicopter and Rakugi Sakura, which is often uh, mistaken for a Japanese, but it's in fact a Siberian. And here you can see that nice grass-like foliage. This is not my garden. These are, these are planted nicely far apart as, as a display. In my garden, there would be 16 other plants all higgledy-piggledy in there. The, the concept of actually planning a garden is so foreign to me. I, I just, I, I, I have good intentions, but I never follow through on that. Okay. And this is Swans in Flight. And if you have seen this, and you'll, <laughs> if you haven't seen this, you would be amazed that it's a, it's a Siberian. It is tall. Those blooms are six inches across. Um, it is absolutely gorgeous. It's the only, I believe it's the only Siberian to have won the Dykes medal. Is that right, Gary? Yes. And well-deserved. It's an absolutely stunning, stunning plant. And that's like a three-year clump. It, it's an amazing grower. It also provides a beautiful contrast in your garden. You know, if you don't want the dr drama of some of those other colors, um, you know, a nice white uh, sets off all your other plants as well. And so far, it's actually the only beardless iris to win the dikes. Yes, thank you very much. And here's some other variations on the color patterns. We have uh, placatas. You have the, the nice whites and you see we and with rims. I don't know if you can see from this in, in addition to being uh, almost an Illuminata, but I guess it's a Picata. You have this nice wire rim, and there are several that have that. This is, uh, let's see, Emily Ann. This is Galadriel, and this is Courier. And I left the names off here since this is, you know, going to be uh, a presentation for the public. Now they do form seed pods really easily. So if you're interested in hybridizing, that's great. You know, you can grab some seed pods and they germinate readily as well. If you're not, you wanna take those seed pods off because you will end up with little seedlings everywhere. And in a year, you won't know which is your cultivar and which are seedlings. Um, so, uh, plus it will sap strength from the plant. So you might as well pop those things right off here. This is Fisherman's Morning, and this is Here Be Dragons. And um, you can see what, what an interesting color pattern there. The, the hybridizers are doing some phenomenal work with these. And, and if you see in Fisherman's Morning, those style arms are just adorable, and they're almost a uh, turquoise blue. They can be transplanted right after they bloom or in the early fall when the weather starts to cool. This is Roaring Jelly. Um, there are also several, several Siberians that will rebloom. Uh, for me, um, Ships Are Sailing reblooms uh, pretty frequently, but I didn't have a decent picture of it, I'm sorry. Um, and it, it, they don't do that for everybody. And, different cultivars will do it in different places. And I 
not sure if the Reblooming Iris Society has a list of reblooming Siberians, but it might be worth checking that out if you're interested in it. Okay. So just to recap, they make beautiful clumps. They can be left for many years. They like normal garden conditions similar to your daylilies. They like a slightly acid and moist soil and you want them in full to partial sun. And I say partial sun for those of you who live in hot, dry areas, you probably want to give them some afternoon shade. And then the fertilizer should be 10, 10, 10 in spring and then after they bloom. Anything to add to that, you Siberian people out there? This is a, this is a fence at Carol Warner's Draycott Gardens. Um, uh, Jody, this is Andy. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the only thing that I would add is that don't they need like a cold punch to really do well? Because for us here in California, it's hard to grow them. Yeah, you know, that's a really good, <clears throat> really good point. Yeah, they need cold, a cold winter in order to set buds. So they, they're not suitable for the deep south. That's one thing about gophers. Gophers don't like that cold punch. <laughs> <laughs> but then we can't grow Siberians. So. Yeah, you can't grow Siberians. And that's also maybe one reason that a lot more people grow Caesar's brother because Caesar's brother does go, grow further south than a lot of. Uh, that's uh, a good point, Gary. Thank you. And that's so true because I have grown uh, Caesar's brothers for over a decade and it doesn't matter where you put it and how you grow it. So for anyone from the West Coast, if you grow Caesar's brother, um, then you'll succeed. <laughs> I, I would also recommend trying where eagles dare. Um, I don't grow it anymore because for me, it becomes a weed. It grows so vigorously, so tall. It, it, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal grower and it's got a bloom about twice the size of Caesar's brother. But uh, for you guys in iffy areas, you might want to try Where Eagles Dare. Okay, so if you're interested in, in learning more about Siberians, I would recommend uh, going to, out to the Soci Society for Siberian Iris website. They have lots of information there. Okay. Spurious. Uh, Andy can chime in on this since he's the president of the Spuria Society. I have to, excuse me, I have to just turn the page here. Spurias make a really dramatic statement in the, in the garden bed. They can be really, really tall, up to five feet. Uh, although there are some that are only six inches tall. This is Universal Peace, one of my personal favorites. It, it, it's uh, just a beautiful clump and the, it holds those blooms right up at the tippy top and they're just gorgeous. This is another um, easy grower. They like normal garden soil, um, a little on the alkaline side and they're fine. Uh, here where I am, my soil is alkaline to flat neutral, so I don't have to do a lot of amendments for, uh, for spurias, which, which I like. Plus, you can leave them in the same place for 20 years and they'll be perfectly happy. In fact, they resent being moved. So if, uh, if you want to control a clump, you just take some around the outside and give it to your friends and leave it alone and it will be, it will outlive you. It will be very, very happy. They're also very drought resistant once they're established. And you can see they, they make a really nice dramatic statement in your, in your garden. For me, they bloom uh, late. It's always a race to the end to see whether my last bloom will be a Spuria or a Louisiana. And you can get some really dramatic color combinations with Spurias as well. Um, this is a cinnamon stick, and I think this is Highline Amethyst, I think. 
but I'm not sure because the deer come and they move my tags. This is a Missouri gal, and this is a great grower. It's a little, this picture is a little washed out. It's actually a little bluer than that. This is a wonderful growing iris. It's really great. I give this away by the handful. The blooms are also really great in arrangements. They have a very thick stalk and a very waxy substance. And if you uh, uh, pick them early, you can just lay them flat in your car and take them to a show uh, or use them in an arrangement. They're wonderful flowers in an arrangement. The one thing I'd warn you about is they produce nectar. So the ants love them. So if you're going to bring them in the house, make sure you shake all the ants off of them. Um, and here's two more of the typical, typical what I call spuria uh, color combinations. This is uh, Castor River and Premier. Premier is a very old variety. I believe it's from the 30s. And Castor River is uh, 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 late not 1990s, early 2000s. But you see it's the same kind of uh, color combination. But look what they've done to the, they've, they've shortened these long, um, halves and widened all the petals and, and but they're both great growers and the blooms can be really tailored or they can be really roughly this is ross island from uh, nancy price i believe and this is sky dancer and look at those nice ruffles on that. And look at the, how wide those falls are. They're just beautiful. Just beautiful. Jody, here's a question. It asks, are, do spuria only have one bloom per stalk? No. In fact, you can see on this stalk, we've got, we've got two, two sockets here, two sockets there, and a socket there. So this one's on this one stalk has got, and maybe, yeah, five. It's got five on that one. Andy, is there, a, is there a standard number of blooms they're trying to go for? Um, so um, basically, there's a big difference from the number on the East Coast and on the West Coast, believe it or not. Um, for example, um, some of the spurias have three to five um, blooms on per stock on, the, let's say, Kansas or either east of there. And, and uh, here in California, I've had uh, some spurias with up to 12 blooms. Uh, oh they just love the heat. They love the heat. And we know that. We know that. And so it's, it's just how it is, you know. And also in California, we have more of a long period of, um, you know, gr growth. So, so, yeah, big, big difference um, in, in the number of blooms. Here's, an, here's another question for you, Jody. It says, this is from Dottie. She says, my spuria clumps tend to die out in the center. Should I just leave them alone? Um, I, I, I would uh, take the center out and put some compost in there and see if, and see if your rhizomes will grow back into the center. Andy, have you had that problem? I haven't had that problem with the centers dying on mine. You know, I have seen that in some spurias, uh, although the majority of spurias, uh, here's a big difference with you referred to already that they don't want to be bothered and they don't, you know, and they grow all on top of each other. They love that. They, they're just, they, they're very happy <laughs> that way. And, uh, but some of them for whatever reason, yeah, they die in the center and they grow outward. And so, and that's fine, you know, as long as you know, that is doing that and is still growing, then yeah, I would I would put some um, amendment in the center, some new soil, and renew it, and all of that. That sounds good. Another question: Do spuria grow well in the southeast? I'm in zone seven B to eight A, and I've had trouble getting them to survive here. Huh. I don't know why that would be. Um, 
you, you know, the first year you plant them, you want to keep them fairly well watered. Um, I, I, and also most, most hybridizers will send you their rhizomes um, wrapped in um, newspaper or paper towels and wet and, and then and plastic. But there are some that ship them dry. I, and I have had very poor luck with the ones shipped dry. I soak them before I plant them, but I still only have about a 50% um, success rate with those that have been shipped to me dry. So you might want to might want to try them from somebody who will send them to you um, fresh and, uh, uh, you, you know, wrapped up so that they haven't dried out. So a follow-up follow question is, can you start them in pots, perhaps? You know, they, they don't like being moved. So if you put them in pots, it's going to have to be a large enough pot that when you replant them in the soil, they don't realize you've done it. Because they will sulk. No, I, you know, I've moved some of these because I'm, you know, as I say, I don't plant a garden and all of a sudden I've got a five foot plant in the front where it shouldn't be. And so I move them and then they sulk for a year or two and, and give me nasty looks when I walk by them. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pot them. And, you know, if you get them too late in the season to plant, like, you know, I've had California hybridizers, or, or uh, forgive me, Joe, Louisiana hybridizers send me things to plant after my ground has frozen. And obviously I have to pot those, but I wouldn't pot Asperia. Um, uh, back to the growing them in the Southeast. I do know there are some people in the Carolinas and Georgia that do grow them. Um, I, I'm not sure what they're doing um, differently than, you know, uh, some of the people asking the questions, um, but they should grow there, I, I believe. There is one thing that you do have to consider is that uh, borers will attack spurs. <laughs> and they don't, you don't have the telltale signs that, you know, with the notches and all of that down the, the leaves that you have with bearded irises a lot of the times, you can't, you can't really, count on seeing that uh, to see if you have um, borers, but you can get borers in, um, in spurious and in Louisiana's. They love Louisiana's. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll talk about that too. And I'll tell you about the borers in spurious. The, the, the leaves of spurious are so tough, the borers can't get into them. What they do instead is they go down the flower stem. Mm -hmm. They, they'll eat their way down the flower stem to get to the rhizome. And, and the, um, you know, Spuria has a good sized rhizome. It's not, it, it doesn't look like a, a bearded, but it's, it's a good heavy rhizome. And so it's, it, plus it's tall, which uh, attracts the moths. So you want to check your uh, flower stems for signs of damage if you think you might have borers in them. Uh, Joey, I, I lost one of my favorites that way, not knowing that it wasn't the leaves they were after. Uh, Jody, another thing is, um, I, I know that people grow spurious all the way up to Canada, so uh, they're very strong. The, the only thing that I was had to think about is, I wonder if the person that is trying to grow them in Tennessee, maybe, maybe the soil is too, it has too much clay in it or something because it, it does need a uh, well-drained soil you know it, it doesn't like like many irises it doesn't like wet feed like they call it and yeah. um so it could be that it could be that that the soil is not it, the water doesn't run you know if if it has standing water it's just gonna rot basically right now i, I know that um dave nicewanger has told me time and time again not to mulch my uh, spurious, but I do mulch my spurious, and I have had no problem uh, mulching them. So I, I, a lot of it depends on your local uh, your local conditions there. Uh, and he's in he's in southern Missouri, 
uh, and for him, I can see why he wouldn't, but here it seems to work just fine. And I have clay soil, but I, I plant these, you know, because this plant is gonna stay in the same place for 20 years, you wanna be sure you plant it where you want it. Um, so mine are on the higher slopes of my property, not at the bottom. The bottom's where I plant the Louisianas. And somebody asked, where is here for Jody? So oh, I'm sorry, know. Ohio. I'm in rural Ohio. And what kind of mulch do you use? Whatever I can get, um, I will buy um, undyed, just plain old undyed bark mulch. We also um, gather leaves and run them through the chipper to make our own. Okay. Okay. Yep, that's all the questions. Okay. Okay, good. And here's some more, uh, just some more examples of color patterns and some of the nice dramatic effects you get with spurious. The, the color combinations are just wonderful with spurious. Something for everybody. And look how nice and wide those falls are. This is uh, Eurasia and uh, Easter colors. I just love the form on that, those tailored ones. And then those are ruffly ones. And, and thank you, Andy, for this picture. This is Highline Snowflake, and this is Offering. And you know, Offering, it, except it's a big, huge plant that almost looks like one of those nice, fluffy little Siberians, except the thing's four feet tall. <laughs> Uh, someone mentions that uh, they grow them in Georgia and the, plant them in the fall. Takes over a year to get them established. Savannah has a great spuria and Louisiana display uh, by Stan Gray. And um, there was an article, a fairly long article, I believe, in the supplement um, about uh, Stan Gray and growing um, uh, spuria in Louisiana and Georgia. And that's, that's the one, I was, one of the ones I was thinking about when I mentioned um, some people in the Carolinas and Georgia grow. Uh, that's spurious. great. So, and here, here's they are at the back of at the back of one of my beds. And you see, they just you know they just make a, a really nice display. And you know they're fighting with the tiger lilies for attention there. And these have been there for, oh gosh, 10, 15 years. And you'll see there's, they have not um, gone uh, um, empty in the middle, luckily. I'm wondering if that's a varietal, if, it, if that's peculiar to those uh, cultivars. Oh, here's some new, new ones. These are, I, uh, I got these. Uh, to grow for a regional convention, and I just thought you might like to see some of these newer ones. The Moonless uh, Moonless Night by uh, Joe Gio, which is the only kind of Gio iris I can grow, unfortunately. And then uh, Lee Walker, some say it's pink, and when it's in a bud, it's pink, but when it opens up, it's actually lavender. You have a question here. It says, we're in Tucson. Is there a particular spuria that would do well in Tucson? Andy, you got any ideas? It's funny, I was typing a response to, to uh, Michael Willing, who asked the question, but uh, all of them, all of them, uh, Spurious love the heat, and so they would do great, great in Tucson, and um, just any of them really have a good collection of them because they, they would do well. Uh, just like Jody said earlier, make sure that when you plant them, they uh, they need to be wet. Um, so, the, you know, you need to acquire them and plant them and, and um, make sure you keep them moist for a while. Once they develop, uh, it just, they're very drought tolerant. You don't have to do much, but they do very well. And um, in fact, we did have a, a mini convention in Phoenix, which is very similar to Tucson, uh, not too long ago, about 10 years ago or so. Uh, oh, it's Xperia mini convention. So, uh, there are many um, members of the Tucson 
I mean, of the Phoenix um, Irish Society who grow Aspirius. So, so I'm there. I'm in Southern California and, and inland though, so I have three weeks of 100 degrees plus, or this past summer it was 110 for about a week. Uh, my spurria died back in the summer because it's just too darn hot, but they're, they're all perked up now, growing. they're all about 18 inches tall. That, that's, that's a good point, Claire. Um, they don't do it here, but uh, in hot places, uh, they will go dormant in the heat of the summer. Um, they never go dormant for me because we, we don't get that hot. And even when we get hot, we still have plenty of rain and stuff. So they stay green for me. They never go dormant, but they will, they may for you. They even stay, stay green for me during the winter. A lot of the, most of the time. Yeah. 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 They're incredible plants. I just can't say enough good about spuria. Okay, so full sun, a neutral to slightly alkaline soil. They are heavy feeders, so you want to work that fertilizer into the soil. And I would mulch and, and make sure you water them in their first year till they get established. And they may go dormant in hot, dry areas. And you want to plant them, give them elbow room because they're going to be a big clump. And once they're established, you know, they don't need a lot of care. They need a little fertilizer, check them for borers. And that's about it. I got to admire a plant like that. And the Spuria Society website is a good place to go for information. They have a really nice website. Now let's talk about Louisianas. Louisiana are native, one are native quick, virus. One quick. One quick question before you move on. It says, will they grow in zone five? Yeah, I'm in zone five. Yep, me too. They grow great too. in yep. zone five. No problem. I think I'm five B. <clears throat> okay, Louisiana's, uh, <coughs> excuse me. This is, uh, I can pirouette from, uh, Peter Jackson, and I didn't have a lot of pictures of a, of a nice stem, but this is a beautiful stem. We've got, we've got four blooms open here at once, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. <clears throat> um, the Louisiana uh, species grow naturally um, along the Gulf states and up through the Mississippi Valley into the Ohio River Valley, and in gardens, they're grown as far north as it's Canada, and I'm hoping our, our Canadian uh, attendees uh, can say something about whether they, they've tried Louisiana's or not. There's an incredible variety of colors and patterns and forms. They are mostly hybridized here in North America, Australia, and New Zealand. This is uh, Royal Love and Our Dorothy. They form beautiful erect clumps with the blooms floating above the foliage. They love the water, but they'll also do well in a normal garden conditions. They'll do well where, wherever your daylilies do well. They're really very adaptable plants. Um, there's one uh, uh, grower that I've been to uh, who grows them on the side of a sandy hill um, with um, with irrigation, of course, but uh, you, you couldn't find a, a less likely spot and they do, they do fine. <clears throat> and this, uh, this gives you a scale uh, of the size of the plants. And note the size of the bloom. So the, the plants are, are roughly 30, 30 to 36 inches tall. And the blooms can be four or five inches across, depending on the size. Some of them are really huge. Um, here in Ohio, they bloom after the tall beardeds, and they last for roughly a month, which is really nice. Some of these, I don't know if you can see it, some of these are container. There's a container there. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a display garden, but um, Louisiana's are sociable to the point of being intrusive on their neighbors. So uh, 
some of us container them just to make sure that we, we know who is actually where in case they decide to go visit their neighbors. And they can get so tall under the right conditions that at a show, you can see here, they've displayed them on the floor. And that otherwise you'd be crank, cranking your neck to look up at these things. Oh, well, you see, we've got some little guys here too, but look at the size of some of these stems. Um, that's a lady from New Zealand right there. They prefer a moist, humusy soil. If you have sandy soil, you, you're going to want to amend it with some compost or you can container them uh, to retain your water. They're very robust plants and they're going to increase quickly. So you want to give them lots of room. This is rooster and this is audition. And you see that's a really red red. So if you're looking for a red iris, you might want to consider a Louisiana. If you have a pond, um, they're ideal for planting along the edge. You can see this is along the edge of mine. I have some actually on the edge, some planted in the edge and some in floaters out in the pond. There's a comment, Jody, from um, uh, Joe says, region five has really fallen in, love, fallen in love with them. I grow most in pots to avoid voles. They have become very popular for our shows. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, they, 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 you can get some really beautiful show stems off of them. That's really wonderful. And again, you know, if you have just your normal garden conditions, they'll do really well where your daylilies, uh, daylilies do. This is Cajun Sunrise, and this is the Chafalaya, which is a huge bloom. And here's a really nice planting. This was at the convention two years ago, three years ago, maybe even longer when we were in, in Louisiana. 2018. 2018. Okay, I, you know, sometimes they all run together in my head. So you can see them, the Louisiana's out here by the pond. Lovely setting. And you can get really nice pastels to, to prime colors. This is a uh, Gulf Full Moon, which I think is one of uh, Hooker Nichols, I believe. And the other one is Sea Night, which is a, an older variety, but it's beautiful, beautiful blue. And again, you might want to contain a room um, if, you, if you live in hot, dry areas. I know that I've seen them um, when we were in, uh, New Mexico, no, we were in Texas and they were containered there and they worked very well. And these are just shallow, um, you know, kiddie pools that they're growing in here. And these are some seedlings from Peter Jackson. Um, take a look at this. This is, I don't know how he's going to describe this when he registers it. This is, this is phenomenal. And here it looks like we have some broken color coming along. There are several broken color um, Louisianas like splitter splatter. And, and I just don't have pictures of them, I'm sorry. But uh, Peter let me use these pictures tonight to show you guys this. And for more information, you can go out and visit Louisiana, the Society for Louisiana Irises. Um, they also are involved with a species preservation project, which is really exciting. Um, so you might want to read up about that too. And Lois Rose uh, says, how to describe it? That's why we require photos. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. And then there's a question. Jackson is in Australia. Can yes. we get them easily here? He sells through um, Iris City Gardens, I believe. So, uh, so those seedlings probably won't be available here for a couple more years because he will have to 
he will have to ship them up and then they'll have to be grown out here. But yes, uh, his, his stuff is, I believe it's Iris City Gardens that his can be um, uh, purchased through. Now, um, I don't know if the Heather Pryor is still hybridizing. She was for a while. She did the R. Dorothy. And there's a couple other people too. So um, generally, uh, after a couple of years, they are available here. The Pryors are now in... Um, uh... Uh, Tasmania, I believe. Are they? And um, I'm not sure if they're able to send their stuff here easily or not. Yeah, I, I had heard that they might be retiring, but I wasn't sure. Uh, somebody asked, what were the names of the last two Iris that you had? Oh, let's see if I can go back. And while you're looking at that, uh, someone also asked, what were the names of Peter Jackson's irises? They're, they're seedlings, they don't have names. The last two was, was uh, the last two were seedlings and they don't have names. And then there's a question, um, how far south, zone nine to 10, will they grow? <laughs> will yes. they grow? Yes, they will. <laughs> yes, they will. They will love it. Any any Louisiana breeders in the USA still selling now? Joe, would you like to chime in? Yes, absolutely. Oh, you mean this time of year? I'm not sure what they're, whether they're meaning this time of year or whether they're meaning um, more generally now. Well, there there are many there are many Louisiana breeders in the U.S. Um, whether they are shipping things in November, I don't know. You'd have to contact them and find out. Um, and there was a comment a little bit earlier, um, just when you were just starting with Louisiana's, but Chuck Chapman mentioned that Spuria grow in zone two and three in Winnipeg and Edmonton, Canada. Yes, uh, isn't that wonderful? Thank you, thank you, Chuck. And Louisiana, as you know, there's a big, uh, a big garden in Rochester, New York for Louisiana. So yeah, Louisiana's will go pretty far north too. And uh, yeah, I've seen some growing um, uh, Louisiana's in South Dakota. So. Yep. Okay. All right, let's talk about planting them. Here's, here's a couple of typical rhizomes, uh, Siberian and Louisiana. And you can see it doesn't look anything like your bearded iris rhizome. Um, they're, they're smaller, uh, especially the Siberians are tinier, and you need to keep them moist. They should arrive at your door uh, wrapped um, to, keep them, to keep them moist, and you do not want to let them dry out. They dry, they die. So keep them moist, and if you if you can pick a cloudy day to uh, plant them on, so that they're not really you don't expose all those roots to all the UV and UVA, UVB, and all the sunlight. You want to dig a hole about two inches deeper than you than it's needed, and the reason you're going to do that is you're going to. Mix some fertilizer into the very bottom below where those new first new roots are going to come out. So those roots are going to grow down and then they're going to hit that fertilizer. Place the rhizome in the hole. Well, you know what? There's a thing missing. When you mix that fertilizer in, you want to water that hole before you put your uh, rhizome in it. And then you put your rhizome in the hole with the ground line at the level of the soil surface and spread those roots out because those roots are what's going to hold your plant up. You don't want them all in a little bundle underneath it. Fill your hole around that rhizome and tamp it down. And then water it again and apply your mulch. How much mulch you put on depends on what your conditions are. 
if you're in a place that's going to be hot and dry for a while, you're going to want to put a little more mulch on to retain all that moisture. Because that first year, you do not want that to dry out. If you are already in pretty wet conditions, you probably don't need as much mulch and you want to breathe a little bit better. And someone Thanks. asked here what kind of fertilizer? Again, a 10, 10, 10, 15, 15, 15, something balanced. And here you can see um, this, let me get my cursor down here. There, you see how the, the soil level has covered all that rhizome? So you, what you have there is your green leaves at the soil level. So that rhizome is never showing. Unlike bearded's where in some areas you want your rhizome showing out of the ground. So for your first season, keep them watered. Watch for new growth. Your Louisianas may grow while they're in shipment. They're, they're incredible growers, Louisianas. And it's not uncommon to, to, to take them out of the bag and see new leaves all over the place. Don't expect first year bloom. And again, you wanna uh, fertilize in spring and fall for that first season. Okay, pests and diseases. They're not as susceptible to leaf spot as your tall bearded. And I think it's because the, the, the leaves on all of these are much tougher than uh, your bearded leaves. They all seem to be pretty strappy and tough. Siberians and Louisiana are not as attractive to iris borers as your tall bearded, but they will still get them. Spurious will get, will, get, will get borers because they're so tall and they'll attack the flower stem, not the leaf. I think we talked about that before. They're not as susceptible to rot. Uh, in fact, your, uh, the Siberians and the, the Louisianas particularly like nice moist conditions. Um, I heard Andy say he does, you, you can have rot in uh, spurious. I've never had any of that here, so I can't really speak to it, but I'm sure he's right because he's always right. Uh, I have seen cricket damage in the fall. When, those, when the crickets get desperate to eat anything, they will start chewing on some leaves. But other than that, I have not seen any, I've never seen what used to be called scorch. I don't know what we call it now. I've never seen them get botrytis. Um, so I think they're relatively carefree plants. Do we have any questions on? Yeah, business? there's a couple There's a couple of comments and questions. One is um, how late into the fall can I fertilize? Um, you know, your plant's gonna be taking up, you know, irises only grow and correct me if I'm wrong here, Gary, irises only grow roots twice a year. They grow roots in the spring and they grow roots in the fall. So your, your, and, it, and your roots are going to be taking up nutrients until they get cold enough that growth stops. So if you put fertilizer on too late in the fall, it's not going to do any good. But probably depending on where where this person is, um, right? I'm not sure where they are. If you're further south, uh, where you're not going to get a deep freeze, that um, may work. Um, yeah. There's uh, a couple a couple comments about uh, somebody. Uh, well, Neil says borers love my Siberians, and uh, uh, Dottie says grasshoppers have chewed up my Siberians the past two years. I can attest yeah. to that grasshopper in bad years, grasshoppers will just chew the, the leaves of Siberians right down. Right. Um, and uh, Lara says she's that's in Kentucky where she asked about uh, how late into the fall can you fertilize. So that is further south, so you may be able to uh, fertilize later. You know, you might want to think about it this way. If you still have to mow your lawn, you can probably still fertilize. I made a note about grasshoppers. I, I, I'll check that out here. I haven't seen it, but then again, I have chickens, so 
<laughs> um, there's a comment or a question it says, please rank varieties for deer resistance. <laughs> <laughs> Deer don't eat iris. They will pull them up to see what in the world they are. They will taste them, but they don't eat them. The only time, I, I think I said this before, the only time I've ever seen a deer eat iris is they, one of them scooped out a Louisiana rhizome one time, <clears throat> and that rhizome was up above the ground. <clears throat> it had grown itself out of the ground. So uh, I don't know what was wrong with it. And I don't know what was wrong with the deer that ate it. And a couple of comments about fertilizing again. Um, Bonita says, I'd always heard to fertilize not closer than 30 days before average first frost. I've done it right up to average first frost anyway. And then um, Lisa says, our ground is still real warm in Kentucky. Yeah. Um, and Phyllis asks, uh, or says, I have heard or read that Louisiana's and Spurious can be fertilized with cow manure. Is that correct? I, I, I see no reason why not. Um, I, I will put on, well, you know, I, I use it mostly on my uh, Japanese, but I, like I said, I have chickens and I have pheasants and I will take the poultry manure and mix that with their with the with the mulch, and let it work in work itself down over the winter, so it's there for the spring. I don't see why cow manure wouldn't be fine for just about anything, because it's not gonna. If it's not fresh, if it's if it's rotted cow manure, it should be just fine. Um, and then some comments. Deer do eat them in my yard, says Shanna. And um, Neil says they are toxic for mammals. Um, Carrie asks, will deer eat bloomed flowers, the blooms? And Joe uh, says, uh, deer will eat the flowers on Louisiana's. Well, there you have it, folks. Um, and then someone mentioned, Bauer and Coble told me on a visit that their secret to growth was horse manure. <laughs> I can attest to that too. I used to use horse manure all the time. And when I lived in West Virginia, it was, um, it was great. Rotted horse manure mixed with a salt, sawdust type thing. And uh, that was wonderful. Yep. Uh, Joe says cow manure causes rust. Ah. And uh, Dottie says, I used cow manure on a part of my garden one year. It washed down into my iris bed. I had a stripe of very green iris, which didn't bloom for a couple years. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we, were, we were at a convention where uh, uh, somebody had an aviary. And on the downhill side of the aviary, everything that he had planted had burned out because, the, uh, the, because of the high ammonia nitrogen and pneumonia in the uh, in the bird poop had uh, killed everything. So yeah, you have to be careful with some of that natural stuff that you let it um, you let it uh, work down before you put it on any plants. Now we used to have llamas and I'll tell you llama poop is wonderful because you can put it it's like rabbit poop. you can put it straight on and, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't seem to harm anything. I used to have so, a sign uh, in my uh, garden with llama, I, llama manure, uh, lovingly lavished with llama leavings. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Jody, the other comment that I have is that for us here um, in California, Louisiana irises grow so fast that they will grow on top of each other. So you need to you know, put them a good distance from each other. Because uh, within a year, within a year and or two, they will just be growing on top of each other. And then you don't know which one is which one. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and uh, they also set seed very easily. So if you want to keep your uh, named cultivars uh, true to name, uh, take those seed pods off. And uh, you know, pot them up and, and play with the seedlings, but don't let them 
set seedlings in your beds or you'll never know what's what anymore. Okay. So if you're looking for sources, you might want to go out to the AIS website and look at the commercial directory or go to any of those websites we already mentioned and look for their commercial sources and they'll have uh, they'll have the growers listed there for you. And they'll be much more knowledgeable about this than I am. As I said, this is a basic um, overview for uh, the gardening public. Thank you for watching this video by the American Iris Society. Please subscribe to our channel and don't forget to click on the little bell that will notify you when the next video is posted.